I'm glad to welcome you to worship this morning, whether you're a first-time visitor or this is your lifelong faith family or somewhere in between. And those out in technology land, I don't know how many of you there are. Um, we're glad to have you here. This is Pentecost Sunday, and that's important because some churches recognize that as the birthday of the church. So, happy birthday, church. <laughs> um, there are announcements on the back of your bulletin, if you'll please double check them if you weren't keeping up with the screens. And in addition to that, on Saturday, our own Colby Gallier will be licensed to preach at annual conference. And if anyone would like to go, if we have enough, we'll take the bus. If you don't want to drive, we can get you transportation. Just call the office on Monday, and we'll work out details. So make a note about that if you'd like to go and watch Colby be licensed to preach. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, this is your Connect card. If you'll fill that out, it helps us keep track of numbers. And you can write your concerns or your joys on that. We happen to have a very praying pastor. And he prays over these cards on Wednesday morning. So write down whatever you need him to know. Now, if you'll stand and join me in the call to worship, it's printed in your bulletin, and it'll be on the screen. It's an invitation to the Holy Spirit. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and concentrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing. Remain standing. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we give life to life. You give life to life. From day one, your spirit gazing over the deep, your wind rushing and your breath filling. As creatures of the earth, we inhale your grace, rejoicing in life abundant. We use our breath our being to raise our praise for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and for the mission you give us to spread your love to the world. Lord, you already know the prayers of our hearts, but we lift up to you those who are sick, those who 
need lifting up, those who have lost loved ones, those who have so little. Use us to be your beacons of light to all we encounter. Instill a fire within us to be your love and grace today and always. Hear us as we pray the prayers Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, you've been standing for a while. If you want to sit, that's fine, but I'd rather you stand if you can. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. So if you're standing, your heart's closer to God. So sing. <laughs> my welcome to that which you've already received, whether you're in person in the sanctuary or online. We're excited that you've joined us here for this Pentecost Sunday. A couple of uh, quick notes. Don't forget the baby bottle boomerang. These uh, were made available on Mother's Day. Bring them back anytime between now and Father's Day. Bring them back with your change in there. Or if you want to be kind to Linda in the office, go ahead and write a $5,000 check, okay? <laughs> And if you would like to pick up a coffee mug and a pen, uh, if you are a first-time visitor, of course, these are for you. Uh, but they're, they're meant also, if you have somebody who you've been trying to get to come to church, then take them a mug with the chocolate. Don't eat the chocolate on the way to their house. And uh, invite them to come to church. All right? These are invitation mugs. Um, 
when Jesus was physically present on this planet, there was a large group of men and women who followed him. And they listened and they learned. In fact, they listened to some things that affirmed the faith that they'd been born into and raised, whether they were Gentile or Jew. They are kind of going, well, you know, I've heard these things said all my life. And Jesus brought clarity. And then Jesus also kind of turned the page just a little bit and said, consider it from this angle. He would say over and over again, you've heard it said, but truly, I tell you. In other words, you need to listen. And then he would also tell them something that would surprise them, usually in a form of a story, because story gets behind our defenses. It, it manipulates our way of thinking in such a way that we can see something from that new angle. So he would often end one of his parables, his stories with, those who have ears, let them what? Hear or listen, okay? We all have ears. Some of us are deaf with selective hearing. At least I've heard that. How about you guys? Okay. All right. But we have selective hearing. That's just true. Uh, we listen to certain things because they either interest us or alarm us. Uh, we ignore some other things because they're familiar to us or just don't seem to be meaningful. And for a lot of religion, it falls into that latter category. We've heard it so long in so many different ways that you begin to, when I look at an audience or a congregation, if you don't like that term audience, uh, I can tell which one of you are in sermon listening mode. Do you know how I can tell? And then some of you are going like this, like, I hope he says something worth listening to this Sunday. Okay, <laughs> but, but here's the deal. It's always been so. Um, they listened, and some choose, chose to hear and to learn. Uh, they came to believe something radical, and it's not radical just then and there, but here and now. How many gods are there really? One. And that God is the God of all creation. So whether you think God knows your name and your pain and your shame, or you think that you're far away from God, whether you think your religion has been helpful or hurtful or indifferent, the truth is God loves you as if you were the only creature he ever made. He loves you with a passion. He has a purpose and a plan for your life to bring good into you and into this world through you. That's God's plan. You know, Israel, like so many people today, think that there's one version. They think that there's one plan that is perfect. In other words, our response to God, uh, you know, Methodists are better than Baptists. You believe it? No. And of course, Baptists are better than Episcopalians, right? And all of Protestants are better than Roman Catholics, right? And all of Christen, Christendom is better than Islam, right? So there is... These gradients, these areas of shade, not 50 shades of gray, but there are shades of gray in what we believe and understand about our understanding of God, and we can use those understandings to grade other people. They did it then, too. The Jewish people really believed that there was one God, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim. Listen, Israel, or hear, O Israel, there is but one God. Jehovah. And if you didn't believe in that one true God, then you were Goyim. You were people of the world. You were the Gentiles, is how we translate that in the New Testament. And Jesus, did he go to the Gentiles? On purpose? You remember that story? Uh, this is extra, it's not in the sermon notes. Do you remember that story where he goes to the Gentile woman? Or she comes to him, actually, and she needs a favor. And Jesus has that really awkward exchange if you're a literalist. Uh, he says, uh, the Son of Man did not come to the Gentiles, but to who? The Jew. Now, clearly, Jesus didn't believe that because of his teaching and his practice of interacting with people of all shapes and classes and genders and whatever. Uh, so you have this tongue-in-cheek exchange with this Gentile woman that he, as a Jewish man and rabbi should have never had. And so he ends, do you remember how that ends? He says, you know, you get the crumbs that fall from the Lord's table. In other words, if you happen to be blessed because we're blessing Israel, then that's good for you. But it's an accident. God didn't intend it. 
And she says, yes, but even the dogs enjoy the scraps that fall from the master's table. And I think that after that, it's not recorded. It's a Jerry revised version of that story that's in your Bible, not just mine. I think that Jesus and this woman had a good laugh. Because the world is very quick to say, we know what God wants, and you're not it. So Jesus had this habit of teaching and living in a way that erased the lines that humanity drew. We talked last week about how Jesus is the one real permanent line. He is the dividing line. You either believe he is the son of God or you don't. And that does shape how God can talk with and bless you today in this world and bless this world through you. And it also affects your eternal destination. So there is one dividing line uh, that does separate forever. The sheeps and the goat, you remember that story. But the truth is this. We are not the one that is the dividing line, and we're not the one who decides which side of the dividing line others are on. This shocked and amazed the disciples and the people who came to listen to Jesus. He was so clear on this point that in John, the 6th chapter, the 66th verse, John 6, 66, ever heard of that number before? Uh, In that verse, in your Bible as well as mine, it says, The people could not accept what Jesus was saying, and so they walked away. And then he turned to his faithful core, the 12 at that time, and he says, how about you? Are you going to leave me as well? And Peter, ever the, not just fisherman, but the cocky, confident guy, says, well, where would we go? You alone have the words of life. So they decided to hang in there, okay? So where are you at today in your journey? Jesus is truly the dividing line, but Jesus is calling us to invite everybody to the table. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It is Communion Sunday. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a Methodist. Uh, The truth is, you can come, even though it does say in your Bible as well as mine, do not eat or drink of the table in an unworthy fashion. And then it'll go on and say, to do so is to drink and eat damnation on your eternal soul. But here's what is meant by that. Don't come to the table thinking you're going to erase your slate because it's gotten too heavy, too full, too much guilt, too much whatever. Don't think you come to communion to erase the slate sheet and go out and fill it up again. That's not the point. The point of communion, the point of the communion, the church of Jesus Christ, is to give us a place where we can inspect our life and see where God is working, and determine where God wants to work in me and you, and then find ways to allow the Holy Spirit to do that work in me and you. Does that make sense? This is the church of Jesus Christ. We're not a hammer, and we're not a sword. What we are is an open invitation to all. This is who Jesus was. This is what Jesus said. So these disciples were in a, in a growing separation from what their faith community, their nation believed. They believed that Yahweh was the God of Israel, not the God of anyone else, even though in the Old Testament they very clearly were told, the reason I am blessing you is so you can be a blessing to who? The nations. And that's still true. What's true for Israel then is true for each of us today. You have been saved by Christ so that you can invite others into that salvation. Jesus said these things, and it was so radically different than what they heard, what they came to believe and accept about the way the world was. Yahweh wasn't just the God of Israel, but the God of nations, the God of everyone. And the Holy Spirit is an open invitation to each man, woman, boy, and girl come and experience the love and the grace and the mercy of God. You know, if you understand what I just said, then you are beginning to understand Pentecost. Because Pentecost, yes, it's marked as the birth date of the church, but what it really is, is this open invitation to the world to come and experience the God who is. So let's step into that Pentecost moment when the church was born 
It should have died when Jesus died on the cross, when they were hiding in the upper room for fear that they would be killed next. It should have died with the persecution that experienced over the next 2,000 years, including the persecution we experience today in growing measure here in the United States, where a biblical Christ-centered lifestyle is now not just incongruent with the growing cultural norm, it is rapidly making its way to being illegal. Certain parts of the Bible that if I were to preach just as a Bible preacher in Canada, it would be labeled hate speech. We're not that far behind it here in the United States. So what does it say? What does it mean? And what I do about it. It's not my opinion. It's not my political party's position. It's what does God's word say. Pentecost is about allowing the spirit of God to enter our hearts and our minds and into this world in ways that bring conviction and healing and hope. So God's kingdom on earth, it has a name. What is it? Starts with C-H, ends with C-H. Church, you did very good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the church. This is the kingdom of God. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church is supposed to be discerning and living into God's will on earth. That is who we are called to be. And it really begins in this moment. It wasn't in the upper room. It was when the disciples left the upper room and talked to the world about God's goodness. Just listen. Peter preached for a long time. I think he went to Asbury. What do you think? <laughs> so he preached for a long, longer than me, by the way, just so you know. All right. <laughs> Have you ever been to like the Dominican Republic or Haiti? Uh, and they do street preaching as well as preaching in those churches down there. And if you preach for 45 minutes to an hour, you know what they do? Say, okay, good start. Keep going. <laughs> If you preach for 45 minutes an hour here in the United States, what do they do? They leave. You know, I had a lunch appointment. See you, preacher. <laughs> so Peter preached for a long time. He had the best things in the world to say to a world that was desperate to hear it. That message hasn't changed. It's not about tickling your ears, although I do love a good joke. It's not about uh, turning something in a way that maybe you haven't seen it because you learned about it as a child and you think it's all about a whale. But it's really about allowing the Holy Spirit in this time, where hopefully you're not focusing on my voice or my words, but on the scripture that we're opening up for all of us. Hopefully the Spirit is talking you to you through the message, not me. So read what's in yellow, because this is what he preached. Save yourself from this generation that has gone astray. Now, many of us are right back into that default mode, us versus them. But Jesus talked to the Jews. Jesus talked to the Pharisaical party. Clearly, he was a Pharisee, two basic parties. I you know there was the Essenes and uh, the Sicarii, but uh, two basic political parties, which were Jewish sects, Sadducees and Pharisees, and clearly Jesus isn't a Sadducee. He not only preached about and taught about the resurrection of the dead, he brought them back, and then he came back. So the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in a resurrection or angels. Jesus talked to angels, and he did resurrection. So clearly not a Sadducee, a Pharisee, and that's why you see these pointed exchanges. Sort of like you argue differently with your brother or sister than you do with someone else. So he is in this heated running battle with the Pharisees. And Peter and all the other disciples, were probably, except for the Sicarii, two Sicarii in there, Judas you already know, um, but another who probably is a Sicarii. Um, anyway, they listen to Jesus even though they are being convicted by his words. They really believe in this us versus them world. So save yourself from this generation that has gone astray. By the time these words are being preached, Peter is saying, I'm in that generation. And all of my brothers and sisters in the movement called the way, they're in that generation. And by the way, so are you. We're all in this boat together. If you're in a boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and somebody pulls out an auger and begins to, to screw a hole in the bottom of the boat, what are you going to do? 
Stick them, <laughs> throw them overboard. No, <laughs> no, you know, the Apostle Paul will later on write in the same book that they toss me overboard. I'm the reason there's a storm. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Um, you, we are all in the same boat. This is the story of Pentecost. God didn't come to save this part of the world. God came to redeem all of creation, the cosmos. God is still in this business of salvation and redemption through this story. Save yourself from this generation that has what? Gone astray. In other words, take a look at where your feet are. Take a look at the, the path, the direction that you're following in your life. Take a look at what you taught, were taught by your family, your friends, your religion, your culture. Take a look at where you are and compare it against God's word. The plumb line in human history and the plumb line, what tells you what is true north in your life. Save yourself from this generation. They think they've got it right. They think they're going in the right direction. They think they're being more loving and compassionate when in fact, if you hold it up against God's word, they are now half a bubble off. They're no longer square with God. So those who believed what I just said, those who believed what Peter just preached over several hours, they believed. And what did they do once they really believed? Read on the screen, what does it say? They were baptized, which means they joined into the faith. Again, the vast majority, if not every single one of them, was Jewish. And baptism in this sense, and it's still true today for the Christian church, it's when somebody outside comes through the baptismal water so that they can be part of. So a good Jew would be offended. A good Jew would be perplexed. What do you mean I have to be baptized? That's for the goyim. That's for the Gentiles, the ones in the world. And these people believe to the point where they would say to their parents, I need to be baptized. They would say to their family, their friends, their business partners, I need to get right with God. And they would have been offended. What do you mean you need to get Abraham as your father? You were born Jewish. This is your right. You are right with God. And a lot of the church believes that nonsense today. When you are baptized, you are saying, what I was is not what God wanted me to be. And that sets you against a generation that has gone astray. You know, I still remember a young Jewish woman who came to our Wednesday night singles class, which turned out to be a, you know, a mix and match thing. We did a lot of weddings out of that singles class. Uh, but she came and she was pregnant. She wasn't, had the, didn't have the benefit of a wedding ring. Uh, she was pregnant, and can I fit in? Again, she was a good Jewish girl. And, and uh, we said, well, yeah, come on in. And we were doing Getting a Grip or something. It was a book out of Bill Heibel's ministry. Uh, basics of Christianity and how it could help you get a grip on your life. And uh, she just ate that stuff up. She was amazing. Uh, and then through the course of that, as she began to trust us as people who wouldn't treat her as if somebody other, somebody is less than, somebody is an outsider, she just became part of our group and we loved her. her. She finally trusted us enough. She told us that her father had written her out of her life. Literally, you're dead to me. You're dead to me because she was going to a Christian church because she had a baby out of, was having a baby out of wedlock. All these things that, a very rigid faith, it could have been any faith, could have been Christian, Muslim, Jewish, atheism, uh, said this makes you good, this makes you bad, you're broken, you're dead to me. Well, when she had this baby, it was a beautiful baby, and she and I went to her dad's house. She said, he won't see me, he won't talk to me, he won't look at me. And I said, let's go. So we went to his house, knocked on the door. This really nice guy opens the door, and he's smiling at me. Then he sees her. The smile left his face. You could see him cloud up and get really, really angry. And he started to just slam the door, and I said, this is your grandson. Look, if you follow his gaze, see his heart soften through the softening of his face. He leaned down and kissed his grandson. He hugged his daughter. And that's real Pentecost. That's where you stand over and against the teachings of a generation that says you're in and you're out. The teachings of a generation that says you're less than and I am more than. It's that moment that levels the playing field. This is Pentecost. It's 
baptism through the fire of the Holy Spirit, affirming your worth, and you deciding to follow that way instead of some other way. They joined with the other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is what I teach, God's word. I've got my own political positions. You don't need to know what they are. I've got my own personal persuasions. You don't need to know what they are. As your pastor, my job is to get you into God's word, teach you how to interpret it. What does it say? What does it mean? What do I do about it? And apply it to your life. That is my role in your life. And I don't care what your political party is. I don't care what your socioeconomic class is. I don't care uh, that you were raised fundamentalist or you're from Iliff's Seminary, which is about as far left as you can get without falling off the globe. All right? So uh, my role is to get you into God's Word. They joined with other believers and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, this teaching, not my teaching, and fellowship. What is fellowship? What is fellowship? It's together, yeah. It's that moment at that door. The angry father saw the grandson. Heart melted. Then he could embrace the difficulty in his life. This is being devoted to the fellowship. It's loving people without requiring them to become what you think they should be. Our job, our job is to love people into the kingdom. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts them. You know, it's sort of like catch and release. You know what catch and release is? What is it? Catch a fish and then you release it. If you go through all that work to bring in a 100-pound marlin, why would you let it go? (laughs) But that's really what the church is. We create programs. We create character in ourselves to where anybody can come into our fellowship and feel like they belong, feel accepted, and then continue to listen to what the apostles taught and areas of conviction in their life, the Holy Spirit will deal with. We are in a catch and release. If you love something, let it go. If it loves you, it'll do what? Come back. If not, it was never yours to begin with. We have got to get out of this mode that is leading this generation and so many generations astray. We're not here to fix anybody. We're here to love everybody and to be very clear about our plumb line. This is what God's Word says. And just put it out there and let the Spirit resolve that. Lord knows, I don't want my sins up on that screen any more than you do. So I, like Brueggemann, Walter Brueggemann said, I am a beggar inviting other beggars to go with me to the throne of grace for a morsel of God's mercy. This is what the fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ is all about. That's why once a month, Once every Wednesday morning, we fall on our knees before God, begging for forgiveness, receiving that grace, trusting in his mercy so that we can rise from the communion table as a better version of ourselves than when we knelt. Friends, this is what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. What Peter preached is actually recorded for us in Acts 4.12, it really is a sermon that sounds an awful lot like any evangelical sermon you've ever heard. But it really is a sermon about leadership. Leadership. There are so many great authors, especially Jesus, who's talked about leadership. Where does good leadership begin? At home? Even before at home. Begins in the mirror. Do you realize before anybody else can lead you, you have to lead yourself. You are deciding what you're reading or not reading. You are deciding what you're watching or listening to or not watching and listening to. You are deciding who is going to influence your worldview. You are deciding which tapes from your earlier life you will continue to mount and play in your current life. Many of us, that authority figure was a parent or a grandparent or a teacher or a preacher. You need to filter all of that stuff through this plumb line called God's Word. Here's what I need you to hear. In self-leadership, not everything you believe is true is true. So you need to take an active part in leadership. 
That's what Pentecost is all about. It wasn't a passive receiving of the Holy Spirit. It was hearing, processing, and then acting in a new way, in often cases to old information. Leadership is action, not position. How many of you think if you park a chicken in a garage, it becomes a car? How many of you ever played chicken with a car? No, don't answer that. Uh, it doesn't. Parking a human being in a church weekend after weekend for 50 years doesn't make a Christian. Self-leadership is what makes a Christian. This is the way I was. I encountered Christ in this manner. And this is who I am today. Leadership is action not a position. You're not a Christ follower because you were born in America. You're not a Christ follower because you're Caucasian. You're not a Christ follower because your parents were Methodist. God has no grandchildren. You are a Christ follower because you have led yourself to that place. This is the place. This is the big idea behind what Peter preached at Pentecost, what I try to preach every single Sunday. Read it with me, would you? Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name in all of heaven for people to call on to save them. That is bedrock truth. What is salvation? Remember, this is an adult class. What is salvation? Saving from Saving from hell, you got the big picture. Okay, I've got my fire insurance card. I'm good to go. But that's true. I don't want to end up without a kind of Christless eternity, do you? Yeah, if you can imagine there's no sin or pain or sorrow in heaven, where does that all go? To hell. I don't want to visit all that, especially if I can't get it out of jail anymore. Okay, so here's the deal. We are saved not just from hell there and then. We're saved from ourselves and the hell that others make here and now. So there is no other religion, there is no other name, no other prophet, no other teacher, no other philosophy that can bring genuine salvation. This is what Peter preached. This is what every Bible-believing, Christ-centered pastor preaches every week. We preach Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, because we need to be saved. So where are you at in this big idea? Are you saved? Where are you at in this big idea of leadership, this challenge to lead yourself? Can you imagine? How many people were saved that first Pentecost? 3,000! Can you imagine what would happen to this church if 3,000 people joined in one day? You think it's hard to get to the restrooms now? We'd have to add at least 10 to 12 new services packed down. We'd have to add small groups, which means we need small group leaders. Men and women who have been maturing in the Lord and understand that maturing in the Lord means I don't know it all, but I know enough that I will lead others to at least where I am today. So for some of you who've sat and soaked in the pew for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you would be required to step up, to move out of self-leadership, working on your thoughts, your feelings, your lifestyle, and move into the next level, which is leading others to that place, not just of eternal security, but security here and now by being able to make wiser choices based on God's word, wiser choices based on the Holy Spirit, talking to you, not just your human conscience that every human being has, but that new conversation that happens when the Holy Spirit begins to live in your life, in your world. In this series, we looked at Jesus as one of the greatest leaders that's ever lived. Think about it. In 2,000 years, he has led millions and millions of people to this salvation that we're talking about. There's no other organization that's lasted this long. There's no organization that's led this many people anywhere in the history of man. The question is, where are we being led today? You know, we are going to be going to annual conference here this next week. Uh, the joy is that Colby's going to come and preach 
next weekend and the following weekend. You need to come and hear this young guy. He's one of your own. In fact, I do want to encourage you to go to annual conference this Saturday. It's at 10 or 10.30. He's going to be licensed to preach in this conference. He's receiving his first church. He was in this church. He grew up in this church. Your parents still in this church. He uh, was supported through college in this church, and now he's finished seminary at Duke, and he did very well. I'm on the the DCOM, the District Committee of Ordained Ministry, he presents himself everywhere, a sharp guy. So I hope you'll come and hear him the next two weekends. It's an upgrade, trust me, okay? <laughs> so the only thing I have against him, he didn't go to Asbury, but that's, that's my issue, not his. Uh, <laughs> so here's the deal. Go to annual conference this Saturday. If you don't want to go with a group of bus people, you know, uh, drive over there and just be there. Now, Kim and... And Lisa and I will already be there because she's our representative at the conference and I have to go because I'm an elder in the conference. Uh, but come and be part of this fellowship. He is the next generation. Old dogs like me are dying away. Young pups like him, the ones called to lift up the torch, to hold the cross, beg people to come to salvation. The big idea behind Pentecost is still going on. But we live in a day and age where the church in America seems to be faltering. It's not new. Oh, there you go. How would you like to be in a church worship like that? Some of you say no, but that's Pentecost. Us four and no more? I want to know everybody. It's not a Christian value. That's a value of Satan. If we really did have 12 services, would you know everybody? Would this church, its reach for Christ, extend or shrink from where it is today? And ridiculous measures. So pray for the Florida Annual Conference. Pray for this church that we truly would embrace Pentecost and the idea that it's not us and them. The idea is we are all they, and we are all broken and all desperately need salvation. Uh, so they're on their way to Jerusalem. The disciples were filled with dread, and the people were filled with what? So they're dreading because Jesus has told them in no uncertain terms he's going there to die. The people are in fear because this one they followed, the one that seemed to be this bright light shining on the hill, is talking to his followers in a way that is taking the joy out of them. So taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more said, when we get to Jerusalem, what? It's going to be a party, right? No, no, he said it's going to be a place where I will be betrayed by one of you, and then they'll kill me, and three days I will rise again. So how many of you think that's a problem? Would you describe that as a problem? So now, Jesus didn't sugarcoat the problem. Uh, how many of you are used to, in the church, we sugarcoat everything? We do. Okay. We can't be honest and blunt about issues. That's why behavior that would never be tolerated in the workplace or at school or in the public is tolerated in the church. Well, you know, that's just the way he is. Yeah, you know, that's just the way she is. That's, that's not leadership. Certainly it's not self-leadership if you're being acting in a way that even the world doesn't act in. But it's not group or church leadership where we allow that kind of a lifestyle to be lived out. So we are still in this place. There are crucial moments in every marriage, crucial moments in every home and every business and every church, nation, and denomination. We are in such a crucial moment right now in our denomination. And we need to remember that we are not us against them. We need to remember that we are they, that we are all desperately in need of a Savior, that Pentecost needs to break out this week at annual conference, and the Spirit of the living God needs to descend upon each of us, and not just the ones who gathered in Lakeland, but the ones of us who are sitting in these pews this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning. See, heading to Lakeland are like the disciples heading to Jerusalem. Some of us are filled with dread by the way that Christian and Christian leaders will act out. Some are filled with fear, not knowing what the future holds, but it does hold this. There are now two denominations where there was one a month ago. The United Methodist Church, which is part of what the Florida Annual Conference and this church is part of, and also the Global Methodist Church. There are a gaining number of churches who cannot live into the current 
direction where they're going to. One of the uh, things that I had to pray about before I said yes, our superintendent asked me to preside over a charge conference, which I presided over many as an elder. Uh, That's a business meeting in the church where significant matters are decided. And so I've been asked to preside over one of the two churches in our district that are disaffiliating with the United Methodist Church. Privileged and honored to do that as an elder, but it breaks my heart. It does. I would love for reconciliation to take place, but I understand why it is not. So like Dion said to me, I know you'll be sympathetic, and I know you'll follow the discipline. That is exactly who I am. But it breaks my heart. Not a win in either column because there shouldn't be a column. There is one church of Jesus Christ. Jesus stated the problem. Then and there and here and now. I will be betrayed and crucified and die. When you ignore problems as an individual, it's called addiction. Instead of recognizing it and dealing with it in positive ways, you ignore it or you try to cope with it in negative ways through your drug of choice. Could be caffeine, could be alcohol, could be adrenaline, could be an opioid drug. Addictions are coping mechanisms that do not work instead of dealing with the issues that we have at hand. And then when it moves beyond poor self-leadership into group leadership, whether it's a family, a business, a church, a denomination, a, a state, or a nation, when it becomes a group think thing, when it becomes broken thinking and broken emotions and broken actions, we call that dysfunction. Many of us, if not all of us, came from dysfunctional families. Uh, We have our secrets. We have these things that, well, that's just Aunt Martha. That's the way she is. That's just Uncle Bill. You know, what are you going to do? He's family, right? So, and then if you think you don't have dysfunctions in your family, guess who the dysfunctional one is? Dysfunction is what it means to be human. In heaven, relationships are perfect. On earth, they require forgiveness and grace and mercy. This is the teachings of the Christ. This is your and my experience. They were on their way to Jerusalem. You're on your way into your tomorrow, into your next week, into this next season of your life. You're on your way. But there are things to dread and things that you must fear. What's the name of that ship? How many of you have seen that movie more than once? Have you ever found yourself hoping this time it won't sink? (laughs) But we do that. This time I'll resist the urge to do or not to do. This time, you know, we will get together for Thanksgiving and nobody will fight over the egg salad, okay? Uh, Who's in charge is, is the basic issue. Now, if you're following Christ, we talked about this last week, Uh, Who's in charge if you're following Christ? Christ. Does it matter whether you're on the Lusitania or the the Poseidon or on the Titanic? If you're a Christian, who's in charge? You know, a few years ago, uh, and when I was really sick and just struggling with putting thoughts together and staying in the saddle, I mean, literally, Monday morning, I'd wake up and I'd think, I can't do this anymore. I was in such physical and emotional pain. Um, And then God saved me, quite honestly. Um, But... uh, Anyway, uh, I told my staff I was going to take the month of July off. Do you suppose they were excited to hear that? No, they weren't. <laughs> you know, we had a staff meeting, and I had my, my core staff, which is about 12 people, and they go, well, pff, who's going to be in Daryl Day? Who's going to be in charge, Jerry? And he said it in a way that I knew he wanted to be the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you'll all be in charge, just as you have been. You're in charge of your area. Daryl, you do worship, and Martha, you'll take care of everything else. Anyway, just like here, I'm going to take two weekends off. Uh, You know, Linda and Marilyn are going to take care of everything. (laughs) And Dave and Jeanette will take care of worship. It's going to work. Why? Because there's only one person in charge of any church of Jesus Christ. It is the Lord Jesus. But here's the human reality. Just listen. 
There's two ways of leadership. There's two ways. One is Pentecost, and one is what Pentecost pushes against. See, most people think authority. Most people think that leadership is positional leadership. I'm in charge. Why? Because I have the title. I'm in charge because, why? Because I'm bigger or faster or meaner than you. Um, James and John said to Jesus, you've got this tender moment going on. You know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die, you know. And you think they'd be like, man, that sucks. It sucks to be you, Jesus. Uh, you know. But no, they don't do that. Instead, they argue about who's going to be in charge. Just listen. He says, we want to be in places of honor next to you, one at your right, one at your left hand. But Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Because he's all about servant leadership. He's not about lording it over people. He's about leading people through loving them, through supporting them, through helping them. He says, are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering? When you are baptized into Christ, you, not, you join not just the church, you join Jesus in this suffering servant role, serving the world to lead them into salvation, challenging and changing your thoughts, your beliefs, your emotions, and your actions in this world. Are you able? How many of you remember that song? Are ye able, said the master. This is where that comes from. And of course they said what? Read it with me. Oh yeah, we are able. Have you ever done that where you signed up for something and on the way home you're like, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> I did that. You know, we were, uh, one of the gigs at uh, Aldersgate before we went into ministry is uh, if you're on the finance team, you're also on the counters. So what that meant at that church, we had to have three counters by their rules, and that meant three times a year, one month, I was on the counting team, which worked out because I tried to be home most Sundays, even though I flew a lot. And anyway, I was counting with a guy named Dick Robinson, and uh, he came to my check, and he stopped. And he looked at it. He says, Jerry, I thought you make about at least as much as I do at your level at at and And I said, oh, I probably do, Dick. And he says, not according to this. And I go, I got mad. <laughs> he knew what I gave. It was like a hundred bucks. And and you know, and he was like, Well, mine's at least double that. I'm thinking, what is this? Yours is bigger than mine? I mean, <laughs> I was just blown away that we're having this conversation. And so I blustered up and I said, Well, we'll start tithing. And then on the way home I figured it out. It's gonna be two hundred and seventy five bucks a week. <laughs> I'm thinking when I walked in the door, this lady here was gonna kill me. <laughs> He's got a 400-pound punch. Not kidding. We've measured it, okay? Um, so I thought I was a dead man. And when I talked to her, I said, you know, like four hours later, I'm trying to figure out how to do this and get out alive. Uh, I, she said, well, it's about time. I wondered when we were going to step up to the tithe. Have you ever, in the moment, said, I can do this? And then you realize what the cost is of doing we desperately need leaders because God is going to grow this church. I need people in the pews, but I need people to help us put people in the pews and then put them into service and ministry in the community. You say, but Jerry, I'm not a leader. You are a leader. You must be a self-leader if you're following Christ. And there comes a point in time where whether it's working on crocheting things for our ministry to people with cancer or infant babies. There's a thousand ministries and a thousand more waiting to be born, some of which are in your heart right here, right now, hidden from the world until you recognize it's God's voice calling you to make a difference in this world. Got to grow up. Leadership, Pentecost. Jesus says, you know that this world Kings are tyrants, and they lord it over people. That's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. Whoever wants to be a leader in the church must become a servant. And if you want to be first, that means you are what? Last. See, the world's leadership model is that top one. Anybody ever work for a boss? They told you what to do? In the military, they'd say jump, and then what were you supposed to say? Oh, hi. And that person's leadership style becomes part of the burden, part of the mission that you, as the guy in the trench, has to carry. That is not the leadership model in the church of Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons Pentecost continues to this day. Pentecost continues to add people because everybody who is added is a leader. Where's the leader in that line of people on the bottom? In the front. And he's saying what? 
Let's go. We are doing this together. So what it boils down to is this. What Pentecost is this. It is God through the Holy Spirit coming alongside us, leading us and asking, what can I do to help? I am praying that Pentecost will break out in this church. I am praying that you understand that my role as your pastor isn't to do your ministry. My role as your pastor is to help you experience a personal Pentecost. For you to see that that thought, that idea, that passion, that experience that you have is not to be wasted, but to be invested in other people's lives. And this church will, in fact, grow. Pentecost, God saying, asking you to echo. Read it with me at the top. What can I do to help? Listen, 3,000 joined with other believers and devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. Make sure that doesn't fall down. Okay. <laughs> and what? Genuinely caring, going to the door, knocking and looking at the angry person and introducing them to a new child and watching them heart melt. Sharing in the Lord's Supper, which we're going to do in just a second, and in prayer. And I'd read the last part with me. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I got to tell you, I can't wait see what God is going to do through Roseland Church. I can't wait to see how God is going to use each and every one of you to heal your hurts so that you, in turn, can heal the hurts of others. You understand their needs in a way that this old man never will. This is what it means to be a Pentecost church. Amen? Amen. All right, when you came in, you should have received a communion cup. We're about at that time. Uh, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples in the upper room. And he took a piece of bread and he blessed it and gave thanks to the Father, broke it and gave it to his disciples then and to you today, saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. The body of Jesus Christ is the church. It is always broken in the sense that we are human. It's not meant to be broken in division. It's meant to come together in the one body with Jesus Christ. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and again he offered thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There is but one church. Because there is one Lord and one Savior, the triune God. It is to that God's glory that we ask for and receive forgiveness. Bow your head for just a minute. Father, bring to heart and mind to each person that sounded my voice in this room and online that which your spirit would convict them of. The things that they have done and said or left undone and unsaid that have made them less or made others left less. Father, right now, as that comes to mind, ask them through the power of the Spirit to say, Lord, I cannot, I will not hold this any longer. I release it to you. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, hear these healing words. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord, pour out your Spirit on us, gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for this hurting world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at that heavenly banquet in heaven. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's kids said, Amen. If you would, turn that cup over and release the cracker. And as you take and eat, remind yourself that there is one church and you are part of that body. You have been baptized into that universal faith. Take and eat. Even though you have joined with the body of Christ, you remain oh so human. But we have the blood of Christ. Give us the strength to face ourselves in the mirror 
They give us the courage to face others as they are and not as we would have them to be. And then to receive the power to remain light in the darkening of this world. Take and drink. Father, we confirm the covenant which you have made through each of us. We accept the grace to be what you have called us to be. We receive on this Pentecost Sunday the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be the best possible version of ourselves as individuals, as a collective called Roseland Church, as a denomination in the Wesleyan spirit in the one universal church. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, here and now and forevermore. And all God's kids said, Amen. If you would please stand and join us in our final hymn, which is Sweet, Sweet Spirit. I'm not a runner, but my friends who are tell me there comes a point in every race where you get your second win, where you were struggling before to just breathe, to lift one foot, to put it down again. Some of you are in that place right now. 
receive the Holy Spirit. Receive a renewing of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Receive your second breath. Leave this place with the energy, the courage, the hope, and the joy to be the best version of you tomorrow and the days that follow. And that is Pentecost. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Don't forget Colby next Saturday. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.